Hello everyone and welcome to the My First Prop mini series. Today we're going to be looking at all the steps required to create two props with no experience inside of 3ds Max or the texturing software which is Photoshop or Substance Painter. Creating a custom model consists of three parts, creating the 3D model itself, texturing the 3D model, and then exporting it. All of those steps have sub-steps to them, so we're going to split this up into three different videos modeling, texturing, and exporting. This video is to serve as a jumpstart guide, not a definitive guide. It's also going to show my personal workflow when creating models for Source Engine. Inside of Hammer, I have a crate placeholder and a barrel placeholder. What these are going to serve as is a reference size-wise for when I create my model inside of 3ds Max. We're able to easily import these objects from Hammer into 3ds Max using the Wallworm plugin. We'll start by selecting both of these, copying them and opening a new Hammer file, and then just pasting them in. Once they're in the file, that's all I care about. I'll go to File, Save As, save it on my desktop, and hit Prop Export. The name is pretty irrelevant, and we can close Hammer now. We'll now load 3ds Max. I'm using 3ds Max 2017. Other versions of 3ds Max will also work. Things may be a little different between versions, but most buttons should be more or less in the same place. As soon as you load up, if it's your first time loading 3ds Max, your viewport will look different from mine. We can right click on some empty space up here, go to the viewports layout tab. We dock that guy to the side. You'll have some viewport layout options. I'm just using this one right here. The default is all quads. I don't like this one, so I use this one instead. I'll just get rid of this guy. If you'd like to learn more about 3ds Max specifically, I have a beginner's guide series playlist on my channel. If you go check that out, you'll learn more about 3ds Max there. To import those brushes, we have to use the Wallworm VMF importer. Wallworm is a plugin for 3ds Max that handles all the in-between from Source Engine to 3ds Max. You can get Wallworm model tools in the description below. There is a paid version and a free version. The free version will do what you want. After you've installed Wallworm model tools and you have the button up here, to learn how to install Wallworm model tools, there's also a video on my channel that you can watch instead. A link to that is in the description. After Wallworm Model Tools is installed, we'll go to Wallworm, Wallworm Importers, Import VMF or Map File. Once the window is opened, click Choose VMF or Map to Import, and we'll select the Prop Export file that we have on our desktop. If there's a lot of objects in that map file, it may take a second to import. Then once it's done, we have our objects here. A quick navigation tutorial is you hold middle mouse to pan, and you hold alt and middle mouse to rotate around objects. For easier navigation, in the bottom right of 3ds Max, you'll want to click and hold on this button here and select point of interest rotation. This feature is only in the 3ds Max 2017 and above. This will make it so that way when you hold alt and middle click, it rotates around where your cursor was. Let's start with just the box. I can hide the barrel by just going over on the right and then just hiding it over here. It'll be one of the brushes that we've imported. I'll then just click on my box to select it and I want to put it in the middle of my scene. To do that, down at the bottom, I'll just right click on these little slider spinners down here and that will set it to 0, 0, 0 in the world. Since the bottom of it is below the grid, I will want to raise it up. I can do this easily by using the snaps in 3ds Max which is this little three up here. If you click on that guy, that will turn snaps on. You should start to get little points as you move your cursor around the 3D view. If you don't, you can hold shift and right click anywhere to open up the snaps options. There are also additional snaps options if you just right click on the snaps toggle. The only snaps that I really want right now are grid and vertex. We can keep midpoint on as well. Now I want to set my constraints on the transforms up here. If you don't have this guy, right click on some empty space and you want to enable the axis constraints. You'll want to match what I have here, which is enable axis constraints and snaps, and then just set it to Z. This will change as you click on X, Y, or Z. We can see that it changes. Then just grab the corner of the box and move it to a grid point and you'll see that it snaps to the bottom.
Now I want to create a new box object inside of 3ds Max instead of using this brush object. To create a new object, we're just going to go over on the right and under our create panel, we will select box. I can then click and drag to create a box with approximately the same size as this guy here. And when you go to create it, if it freaks out how mine was just doing, you can hit S to turn snaps off and it becomes much smoother. I'll just right click to stop creating that box and I want to go out of create mode so I'll just right click anywhere. I'll go to the modify tab which is this tab to the right of the plus and here I can set additional parameters on my box essentially fine tuning it. I know that this crate is 48 by 48 by 48 so I'll just match that by typing 48 by 48 by 48 in all of these. If you're concerned about what units we're working in, if you go to customize at the top and unit setup, we want to be using generic units. These are one to one between 3ds Max and Hammer. Now we can begin modeling this box. I don't want to have this box here anymore, but I'll name it and then just move it off to the side, hide it just in case I need to use it later for size. To name it, I can just double click on it over on the left. And if for some reason you want to switch between layer or hierarchy mode, you can do that with these buttons down here. If this window isn't even open, you can open it by clicking either the Toggle Scene Explorer or Layers Explorer at the top. I'll rename this object by right clicking on it, going to Rename, and I'll name this Source Box. And I can just hide that. I'll now select this box and put it in the middle of the scene again by right clicking on all of these. I'll now press Alt and W, and that will maximize this viewport. The type of crate that we're going to make today is based off of a simple crate image that I found online just on Google. We're going to create something like this. Now I'd like to have this image inside of 3ds Max so I can kind of use it as a reference. I can easily do this by going to the Create panel again, just finding a plane, and I'll just drag another plane out. Then once that plane is there, I'll hit W and that will select my move tool up here. And then I just want to take this image and drag it right onto the plane and it'll apply the texture right for me. I can now hit E to go to rotate mode. And when I rotate, we get a little readout of the rotation that we have. This is fine rotation, but I want to use snaps rotation. So I can hit A to enable that right here. And then I can just rotate this guy by 90 and then by 90 again. I can hit R and that will get me scale. I can just kind of rescale this to get whatever size I want. So the move, rotate and scale tool hotkeys are QWE. I'm not going to build this one for one off these. I just want it as a reference. Selecting our box again, let's go to the modify panel and we'll want to add an edit poly modifier. These buttons I've added manually because these are commonly used modifiers that I use a lot. If you find yourself using the same modifiers from this modifier list, instead of clicking the drop down, you can click configure modifier sets and configure modifier sets here. This will allow you to drag out new objects from the modifiers tab to these buttons that you put here. But for now, we can just click the drop down, find edit poly, and then click that. Under edit poly mode, we have a few selection options. We have vertex, edge, border, face, and element. These are our sub-object selection modes. I want to see the wireframe on this prop, so I'll hit F4 to enable that, and then we should see some white lines appear on the edges of this prop. To start, we'll go into face mode, and this will allow us to select individual faces on this object. Since every face on this object is basically the same, we can just select them all by making a box, or pressing Control A also works. We can then go over on the right and click inset. Clicking this will bring up a little window. If your little window doesn't look like my little window, that's because your caddy controls are currently set to enable. If I turn this on and then click this little button, this is probably what you have. I'm not a fan of this, so I turn it off. Going back to inset, I don't want to click inset itself, but the little button next to it, this is the settings. We can then change this spinner and if nothing happens, we'll want to switch to by polygon. 
we can now see that when we increase and decrease this spinner, we're insetting these edges. I'll inset it an amount of about maybe 2.5. Once we're done, we can click OK. And now we just need to push these in a little bit. We can do that by using the extrude option. So we'll click the settings again. And as I drag this out, we'll notice that we're going outwards. We don't want this, so we'll just go inwards. And if we go in too far, we'll end up extruding the other faces into each other. We'll just not do that. About right there should be good. We can then click OK to confirm that. One thing that I'd like to say, if you have any modeling experience before, you may have heard the term high poly and low poly model. Since we're going directly to Source Engine and this is our first prop, we're not going to be making a high poly model. We're going to be making just a low poly model and exporting that directly. High poly to low poly modeling requires us to make two meshes and then bake down the high poly details into our low poly model. For now, we'll keep this as a pretty simple prop. The last thing that I'd like to do is add these little grooves into the panels of the prop. We'll want to switch to edge mode. We can either do that by clicking on edge or hitting the number two key on our keyboard. Numbers one, two, three, four, five will select the respective icon over here. I can now click on an edge here and it will turn red and I'll select the opposing edge as well. I want to do this all the way around the box. With the opposing edges selected, I can now go to the connect option. And you'll notice that this is drawing a line between the two edges that we had selected on every face. I can increase the segments, which will essentially draw more lines, counting one, two, three, four. There's about four on every side. Let's just set it to five and hit OK. Now all these new edges are still selected. With all these edges selected, let's head over to the extrude section. We'll set the height to zero and the extrusion base. Let's set to about 0.35. We can then click OK. And now we have an edge in between all of these other two edges. What we want to do is control click our polygon. And this will convert our edge selection into a polygon selection. Now let's click extrude. We want to do by local normal and our extrusion height should probably be about negative 0.35 ish. We can type that value in if we want and then just hit okay. Now let's go back to edge mode. And with all of these edges selected, we want to remove them as they're creating additional triangles in our model that we don't want. We can easily add all of these new little edges to our selection by going and clicking loop. This should automatically select all of them. And now we can just hit control and click remove. Holding control and clicking remove deletes the associated vertices with the edge. If we switch to vertex mode by hitting one, we'll notice that there's no vertexes here. If I undo that deletion and then just click remove, when I go to vertex mode, you'll notice that we have extra vertexes here. We don't want that to happen. So I'll bring all those back and then control click remove. And there we go. This prop is pretty much done. It matches up rather well with these. You can do additional refinements if you'd like, but let's just do a quick check to make sure we have no loose vertexes floating around. Early on, when I first started learning 3ds Max, I had an issue where I would leave vertexes hanging around or faces wouldn't be welded together, which would lead to issues when I'd start unwrapping the model. An easy way to check this is to go into vertex mode, select all the vertices, click settings on weld, and if your before number and after number matches with a very low weld threshold, you're fine. Since we have no loose vertices floating around, we can go ahead and UVW unwrap this model. UVW unwrapping is the practice of unwrapping the model to a flat surface that we can texture on later, be it in Photoshop, GIMP, Substance, or Quixel. Now let's add our unwrap UVW modifier. You can do that from the dropdown, unwrap UVW. And when we add that, we'll probably get a bunch of green lines around our prop. These represent seams, and you can learn more about those in a proper UV unwrap video. I'm just going to quickly cover the basics here. 
To easily see how I'm unwrapping the model, I want to apply a grid texture to it. You can find one of these by just Googling UVW unwrap grid material, going to images on Google, and you can find any of these that you like, download it, and then just drag and drop it onto your model. I already have one that I like to use. I'll go ahead and drag that onto this guy right now. And when you drag that onto it, you'll notice the material changes, just like when we dragged the image of our reference art onto the plane. To start actually unwrapping the model, we want to open the UVW editor. In the Edit UVW window, we have similar selection tools, Move, Rotate, Scale, and this option is Freeform Mode, which is kind of like Transform in Photoshop, along with Vertex, Edge, and Polygon Mode. Since we already have our seams at the corner of this model, we can pretty easily unwrap this guy. But to show you how I would do this if our seams weren't already in place, I can reset the seams by clicking Reset Peel, and you'll notice those green lines are gone now. This is a very simple prop, so I can just use Peel Mode to go ahead and deal with it. And now I can just enable Peel Mode and add those seams back for me. When I click Peel Mode, I want to make sure I'm in Edge Mode. And now I'm going to click on these edges to add those seams back. And I'm just going to add the same ones back that I just removed. You'll notice as I click, the texture is going to change and the unwrap in this object over here is changing as well. And now that those guys are unwrapped, I want to remove these pins that Peel Mode has added. So I can go to Vertex Mode, select everything, and click this Unpin Selected. That will get rid of those little blue dots. And now we can easily start by just doing a planner projection on each one of these faces. If I turn on Select by Element UV Toggle, this will allow me to select an entire island at a time. So I can select this guy, and then just hit this quick planner map. And when I click that, it will automatically place it face on. To show you what it's using to source that, if I select that guy there, so these two faces selected will give me this yellow outline here. And what that's representing is the quick planner projection. When I click that, you can see that it has projected those two straight on into this viewport. Another option is to use the Planner map, if I click that, we'll get that same thing, but we have control over it now. And I can change the angle to X, Y, or Z, or just have it kind of guess best align. Since this is a crate, it's going to unwrap very easily using this projection. So I'm just going to select each one of these and then quick planner it. And I have quick planner set to a hotkey of control Q. To set your own hotkeys, you can do that under Customize, Customize User Interface, and then you can set anything here. I set Quick Planner to a hotkey by going to Group, Unwrap UVW, and then Quick Planner Map to Control Q. You'll notice we're missing some detail in our projections here. Right now, we just have the tops, but there's sides to these corners of the prop. And if we look at them on the grid texture, we can see that it's stretched. That's because there's no pixel information for those faces. An easy way to add that in is we need to add a few more seams. Not a big deal. If we go to edge mode and I want to turn my symmetry on, I can double click on this edge here and it should perform a loop operation that will automatically select the next edge. And with our symmetry mode on, it should get the other sides as well. I'll just want to hold control and select all of these guys. So I want to do this on every set of corners here. And you will also notice that it's selected the borders of each UV island. That doesn't matter since we're going to break these edges and those are already broken so it won't do anything. I also want to state that there is probably a better way to unwrap this crate, but the way that I'm showing you right now will probably teach you a bit more about how UVW unwrap actually functions, letting you do a bit more with your own props instead of just making crates. We can now click break under explode and you'll notice that these have turned green. That's because these are no longer connected. If we select one of these and then click relax, you'll notice that the corners split apart. 
This is because relax mode is going to start relaxing it into its actual shape. We can right click on it and hit relax and then just hit start relax and it'll do the whole process much quicker. One small thing is that on the sides, these little grooves have the same issue that the sides had, but because these are so tiny, it doesn't really matter and they're going to be dark anyways. You won't really notice that distortion, so I'm not going to deal with it. I'll select the rest of these and then I'll right click on them, hit relax, and then just start relax. And they should all kind of peel apart at the corners where we've added those seams. I'll hit stop relax. And lastly, we can go ahead, select all of these, and we can scroll down and hit this pack normalize button. What this will do is it will automatically pack all the objects and normalize them to each other so they're all relatively the same size. Now you may notice that we have some extra space here. We have a few options with this unwrap. Now how the unwrap works is if I click this drop down and click the UV map texture that we're using and I select this face here. So this face is mapped to these coordinates on our texture. What that means is there's nothing mapped over here and we're just wasting that image space. We have a few options. We can choose a side, scale it up, so the top would have a lot more detail than the bottom. That's not as ideal. I do want to turn my symmetry off since I'm not using it anymore. Another option that we have is stacking UV elements. Stacking UV elements is useful in certain situations, especially on a crate. To show you what this does, if I select this guy here, and then I tell it to pack custom, and that's just going to fit it to the box here, and then I select this guy and hit pack custom as well, you'll notice that they're stacked right on top of each other. And what this means is that these guys are now sharing UV space. This can affect issues such as baking later on, but if this is a simple prop, we can get away with sharing UV space. So to show you what I mean, the top and the bottom of the crate now have the exact same texture coordinates. This is an all right method, since the top probably won't be seen with the bottom at the same time. Since having five squares here won't give us an ideal unwrap, I'll stack two more sides together just so we can get the most out of our UV space. I'll hit pack. I'll select the opposite side, hit pack again. Group these guys together. Now remember, this group and this group, so the top and bottom and two sides are grouped together. And now that they're grouped, when we hit pack normalize, we get much more pixel density out of our UV space. I can then hold control and alt to kind of scale this up a little bit, get a bit closer to the edges. And there's a lot of space in the middle. This is referred to as padding, and we don't need that much padding. So we can select all these guys, turn the padding down to one, tell it to pack again. And now you'll notice that they're closer together. Padding is used for when we have the textures change when we're at a distance from them. It's not going to be the end of the world to have this much padding, but for higher density props, you may want to explore having less padding. That's all there is for this object. I'm going to go ahead and close out of the UVW editor. I'll select my crate model here. I'll rename it. And I'll just hide it. I'll bring back my other brush, which is my barrel. And we're going to start the exact same way. We're going to center it in our scene. I'm going to turn snaps on by hitting S. I'm going to set it to the Z coordinate on my axis constraints. And I'm going to bring it up to the zero point on my grid. I'll now go to the Create tab, choose Cylinder, drag a cylinder out, and then up. I'll turn snaps on, match it to that height, and then I will zero it out in the scene. It doesn't look like our brush cylinder is quite centered, so I'll just approximately center it by hand. I'll go back to my cylinder. Under the Modify tab, I can drag the Radius slider up until I get it to be about the radius that I want. We'll just do 16. I'll rename this brush object to Source Barrel, and then I'll hide it. I don't care about it anymore. I'll bring my cylinder back, and you'll notice that there are lots of rings around the cylinder. These are our height segments, and we want to set these to one for right now. You can start with maybe two segments, but we'll add those loops in 
manually under Edit Poly. I want to bring my concept image for a barrel in, just another barrel I found on Google. And that's, uh, that's good enough. I'll just fix it so it's about the right aspect ratio. What I'll start with is by adding these rings around the side. We'll need to add an Edit Poly modifier, so that way we can access the sub-object modes. And we have two options to easily add these rings in. We can use what's called Swift Loop, which is a tool up here, a very useful tool, and as we move our cursor around the object, this line will appear, and every time we click, it will insert a loop. Swift Loop does a lot of things, and it's totally worth your time to learn how to use it. Another option is to use Connect, which is what we did on that box. So if I select one of these edges and then click Ring, this will automatically select a ring of edges around my prop. On a cylinder like this, it's going to select every side. One thing that I'd like to show you is how the stack works. So right now I have an edit poly. I can go down to my cylinder. I can increase or decrease the sides of my cylinder. Now there are times when you can't go down in this stack. For instance, if I make this 64, I come to my edit poly, I select a ring of edges, and then I add a bunch of edges in. Now when I go down to my cylinder, if I click this little test tube icon that show end results, which will show me the end of the stack, and I start changing the sides, wiggy things are going to happen. We can see that the edges are totally messed up. You can only go down in this stack under certain modifiers, which you can learn about more in other 3ds Max videos like my beginner's guide series, which I highly recommend you check out if you want to keep modeling. Since this edit poly modifier is pretty much dead, we can just right-click on it, hit delete, get rid of it. I'll set the sides on this to 16. Actually, we can go a little crazy, go with 24, and have a super good-looking barrel. We'll add an edit poly in. I'll do my ring selection on my edges. I'll go to the connect settings. We can do two segments, right? Okay. And now it looks like they divot in and then divot back out. Select this loop and then do another ring. I'll click connect again. We'll add two and then I can adjust the pinch slider to move the rings closer or further away. Now what I want to do is bring them about right there. So about a 75 pinch. I'll hit OK. And now I want to remove this top loop and this bottom loop. So I'll hit control and then click remove. Another option is control and the backspace key. We'll do the exact same thing. I then want to select this center loop. With both of those center loops, I'll go to extrude, set a extrusion height and an extrusion width. I'll hit OK. And now I'll select these four rings. And I'll go to extrude again, but this time I want to do a negative extrusion. So they go inwards. And now you'll notice that we have this little tiny ring of faces here. Now we don't want these and we can get rid of these by doing a weld. So I'll go to vertex mode and I'll just select the entire prop. And if we zoom in and click on the weld settings, as soon as I click it, we see that those went away. If I turn this down to zero, they come back. So as I click this up, eventually they all just kind of snap to each other. So what it's doing is it's going to find vertices that are this close together, and it's going to merge them together at their average point. So as long as none of our other vertices are 0.1 units away from each other, we're fine. I'll just click OK here. We can actually just get rid of this loop here and this one here. And if I hit control backspace, that'll get rid of them. And now we have this effect where it divots in and then divots back out. You'll notice when looking at it that it's not smooth. Where the rest of our cylinder is smooth, this is because of the smoothing groups on the model, and this does affect how it's lit in game. If we go to the polygon mode and say we just select a bunch of these, we can scroll down to polygon smoothing groups. And if we click on one of these already smooth sides, we can see that it's in a smoothing group of four. If I were to add these to that same smoothing group, we can see that it automatically smoothed them. 
Since this is a very simple barrel, if we just select the entire thing, there's a button here that does auto smoothing, and it will smooth faces together in the same smoothing groups if they're within this tolerance. So when I auto smooth this, it's going to smooth the sides together, so all the sides are in one smoothing group, and then the top of the barrel is in a different smoothing group. Faces are only smoothed together if they're adjacent to each other. If we look, the angle between this face and this face didn't meet that tolerance threshold, so it's not smooth. So if we select this entire thing again, turn that tolerance up, and as long as we don't break 90, we won't have the top smoothed with the side. If the top is smoothed with the side, you'll get this weird looking effect, like that, because it's trying to shade it like it's smoothed at a curved angle, which we do not want. Another option to smooth out that hard edge, if we really wanted to add more geometry, we can double click to select each of those, and we just go to chamfer, this will allow us to kind of smooth out that edge a little bit with geometry. But remember, it's going to add additional tries into our model. So performing that action took us from, we're at 668 tries now. If I undo, we're at 572. So it's really not the end of the world. I'm just going to do it because I like how it looks. I'll set a chamfer amount to about right there. It looks to me like these rings are a little fat for what's on the model itself in the reference image. So what I'll do here is I'll hit Alt W and that will unmaximize. I'll go into my side viewport here. And this is just to easily select only of these vertices here. I'm just going to scale them down. So while they are getting closer to each other, they're also scaling down themselves. Now what I can do is select this ring here, this little indent. And then just move it up and then select this one and move it down to get them approximately where I want. And now I want to select this loop and this loop. And I can't scale on the Z axis inside of edge mode, but if I hold control and click vertex, that will convert that edge selection into vertice mode. And then I can scale these on that axis. I'll just pull those up a little bit. I'm gonna do the same thing on the bottom. So control click, convert the selection. Scale them up just a smidge. To go ahead and smooth the rest of the model out, I can just manually place these guys inside of one smoothing group. I'll clear all the smoothing groups on the prop. By selecting it, hit clear all. Select the top, select the bottom, drop those into one smoothing group. And then I'll select everything else in my side view and put it in smoothing group one. This will give me the appearance that these are actually way smoother than they actually are considering their kind of jagged geometry there. Now we just need to add the top and bottom lip and these little extrusions here. To add that top lip, I accidentally placed those in the same smoothing group as the top. Didn't want. To easily add the little indent here, I'll just select the top, click inset, drag this in a little bit, and then hit extrude and extrude it down. That seems pretty good. Now there's another modifier that we can use to automatically copy what we're doing on the top with the bottom. So if I needed to copy this lip from the top to the bottom, I can use the symmetry modifier if I add symmetry. And when I added symmetry, I had faces selected which is represented by this little box here, which means I'm passing that selection up the stack. If a modifier isn't working how you want, it's because you are probably passing a selection up the stack. You can intentionally do this to get different effects, but I don't want that with symmetry, so I'll turn that off. I'll come to symmetry here. I'll select the Z axis, and we see that it just mirrored it to the bottom. If I click this little arrow and select this mirror point, I can move this up and down, and we see right away what it's doing. It's mirroring the prop on the Z axis from this point here. If I hit flip, it's going to disappear, but if I bring it up, we can see that it comes back to life. So I'll turn flip off, and I'll turn snaps on, and I want to make sure that I have midpoint on. And I'll snap this to the midpoint on that prop. Now, this is a time when you can reach below in the modifier stack. So what I can do here is I'll click this edit poly, and I can add another edit poly on top. And the changes done in a modifier are stored in that modifier. So if I were to 
select all of those and hit delete. I can just delete that edit poly modifier that stored those changes and it's reverted. So I'll hit edit poly and I will go to edge mode and double click here to select that ring. I'll also double click here and we're going to round these edges with a simple chamfer. We need to turn the chamfer mount down a lot. I set it to 0.1, hit OK. And since we're using the symmetry modifier, the underneath has had the same thing done to it. So we can turn those on and off the symmetry modifier to see what's happening there. Now I'll add another edit poly on top of the symmetry, and this will allow me to select the edge that it added from the symmetry and just hit Control Backspace on it. And that will actually bring down our triangle count by about 48, it looks like. We can now just add additional objects on top of this to get this little pore spout right here. We can go back to our create panel, click cylinder. And if we don't turn auto grid on, we can't create objects on top of each other. If we turn auto grid on, I can now just create an object right there, drag it up and I'll turn snaps on and then just using the Y axis because my constraints are on. We have a really easy time doing that. Turn snaps off, kind of get this guy into place. I'm doing this part right here. It's a little tall. We'll shrink it down, turn the radius up, and it looks like there's two components to this. There's like this little hex shape. So I'll need to turn the sides down to like that six, maybe eight. We'll go with six. And that looks good. Turn the radius up maybe a little bit more. And that's probably all right. We can now create a, another cylinder right on top of it. And I'll use my X and Y with snaps on to snap it to the center of this vert and to the midpoint right here. So now I know that's center. And this is actually round because this is that poor spout. It should be less tall though. 12 sides is probably more than enough. We can add an edit poly here. And now we can click attach. And what attach is going to do, it's going to allow us to add a separate object to this object. So when I clicked attached, we can see that the cylinder is going to disappear from our list and it's going to get the same color as the object that we just attached. Now I need to delete the undersides since I don't need them anymore and they're just going to use polygons. So I'll hit Alt-Q, and that will isolate my selection, essentially hiding everything else in the scene. I can go to Polygon Mode, just go to the other side here, select that guy, hit Delete, and then I'll do the same thing for the underside of the spout here. If I hit Alt-Q, again, that will unhide everything. It will unisolate. I can select this top face, click Inset. I'll inset it a small amount. And now if I click the regular extrude button, not the settings, my cursor turns into the extrude icon. I can just click and drag. If it doesn't end up where you want, you can just unclick it and then just move it around like a regular object. Now it looks like there's just this little tabby thing at the back. We're essentially going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create a, another cylinder right there, drag it up some. I'll center it to this point right here. I can add Edit Poly under the Modify tab, Alt-Q, isolate it, delete the bottom, Alt-Q, unisolate, can select this part here, and instead of insetting and extruding, I can just use Bevel. This will allow me to go up and in with it to kind of that get that curved effect. I'll hit OK. It looks like we need to extrude it up. So if I extrude it upwards, that's probably all right. I don't know what this thing is supposed to be, but we'll just add it just for the sake of adding it. And that's pretty much that barrel. I'll select the barrel itself, click Attach, and attach these guys to it. Now I can use this Edit Poly on this barrel to select all of these faces but there's also elements inside of an object. Since I've attached these guys and they were originally separate objects, I can select them as an element instead of just using vertexes or face mode. And then once I've selected them as an element, I can always hit Control 
to pass that selection to something else to easily manipulate that object. I want to do a, another edit poly, and this one's just going to contain some smoothing group changes. Everything on this model that's not like a 90 degree angle should be in the same smoothing group, actually. So I'll set this to about 85, and I'll just auto smooth it. I turn off wireframe, and I turn off wireframe by hitting F4. F3 will turn on wireframe only. F4 turns off the edge view or edge face mode. Now if I just click on a few of these, I can see what smoothing group they're in. And this honestly looks all right. So we'll add that modifier. I will go get my UVW unwrap texture, drag it onto there, and we can start unwrapping. If I hit open UV editor, the unwrap that we have now is terrible. It looks like it's just a planner projection from top down. I want to separate these objects out of the way. I can do that by turning on select element toggle. I'll just click this guy in face mode. Click that one, that one, and that one. So I just want these guys out of the way. I'm going to drag them off to the side. I'll turn that off. I can select this top face here and this bottom face. So I just want the top and bottom circle selected. And if I move them out, they're attached, so it's going to affect the rest of the model. There's two quick ways to separate this. I can either hit explode and then drag it out, or I can hit control Q, which will quick planner it, and then just move it to the side. Or I can hit projection and then turn it off. So those are all ways that you can easily add seams. So now I can just select this guy, and I have both the top and the bottom right here. So now I'm essentially just left with the sides of the barrel. There's a few ways that we can very quickly and effectively unwrap this now. If I select the whole barrel that's left, I could use my cylindrical map for projection, which we can see works pretty well. That's an all right unwrap to start with. But a better way to do it would be selecting an edge and then making a loop selection. So I have this selection running all the way up and down, and I'll actually choose to put it right here. And now I want to, over on the right here, under Wrap, click Unfold Strip from Loop. When I click that, it might make the selection huge. Not a big deal. We can just always whoop, bring it back down. And what that's done is actually straighten out and pretty much unwrap the entire thing for us. It looks like it's added a seam right here. We can see what's going on where this object is. All right, so this is left down there. So it looks like we need to do one more unfold from loop. I can just select this guy, this guy, and this guy. Hit the same button, select all this, scale it down. And if you don't feel like scaling it down, you can just hit pack normalize and it'll scale everything for you and also move it in here. If you don't care how stuff's arranged, you can kind of use pack normalize to get everything back in the center. I want to rotate this so it's at a 90. Now I'll just take a quick look, see what we're dealing with, see how the grid texture is looking. If it's not stretched anywhere, then we're, we're pretty much in business. It looks good all the way around. I'll go back into my UVW editor, and that's perfectly fine for the sides of the cylinder. We just need to unwrap what's left. Now we just have to unwrap these little items here. I'll open up the UV editor again. We can select this guy, and since he's tiny, we can just right click on them and hit relax, start relax, and then stop, and we're done. You may notice that there's a small amount of distortion in the grid pattern here, but it's so tiny it, it doesn't matter. If you want to stop that distortion, you can click on this edge, perform a ring, break it, and then relax, and you'll see that they split off and that distortion is gone but it's like i said it, it's so tiny it, it doesn't even matter so we can just bring that guy back over here what is this this is this guy we can unfold this guy from a loop again so we'll just double click to select that loop click this made it ginormous just scale it down and where is this top face put this top face somewhere so this top face is super tiny and I'd like to attach this top face back to this object. So you'll notice 
when you select edges, the edge that it connects to turns blue. If I hit Stitch Custom here, we see that it kind of angles it. It's not what I wanted. If I select this edge, because this edge will sew right here, and I hit Align to Edge, it should have just aligned it. And now when I hit Stitch Custom, it should bring them right together, and we're still vertical. Just move that to the side. And we got this last guy over here. And again, unfold from loop. But before I do that, I'll select this guy and break it off. That's what I should have done on that last object, but now I'll hit unfold from loop. I'll scale it down again. And again, I want the edge that it's going to sew to over here. So I'll just select this edge here, hit a line, stitch custom, and it'll bring it right to it. So now it's one object again. I'll select all these guys, hit pack normalize, and that's going to get them to be the same size relative to how big they are in the world. But there's a lot of wasted space here. We have a few choices. What I'm going to opt to do is scale the top and bottom up some. So they fill this portion here, maybe a little bit less. And then I'll drag these over. About right there, and then right there. And then these guys are tiny. I'm just going to scale them up. So I get some good UV space out of them. I'll make sure I have the select by element toggle on, so it's just easier to select this stuff. I can just finish packing these manually. I'll flip this guy horizontally. Scale it up. Bring it down a little bit. Scale this guy up. Down some. And then that's probably good. So there we go. Now we have our barrel made. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my content, don't forget to support me on Patreon if you're able to. There you can see all content that I produce early, including the rest of this series. Next time we're going to be doing texturing inside Photoshop and Substance Painter, as well as doing ambient occlusion bakes down onto our diffuse channels. Thanks for watching and have a good one.